Good morning to all of you. Uh, good day of the day to everyone. My, my name is Oliver Hillel, and I'm the head of the Biodiversity Economic, Econom Economy Transformation and Innovation Unit at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And I have the pleasure to welcome you all to this first session of the Business and Biodiversity Week 2021. The session today will focus on the post-2020 global framework and the role of business. The discussion is extremely timely. In a few months' time, at the end of April, May, parties to the convention will reconvene to adopt the most critical global agreement for our planet's biodiversity. This is no ordinary task. According to the science that we know, we have a very small window of opportunity to change our course, move away from business as usual, and revert the current trend in biodiversity loss. The economic sector has a pivotal role to play in this process, and we could not be more excited in having all of you with us today. With no further ado, I want to introduce the moderator for today's session, Mrs. Katya Karusakis. Katya leads the biodiversity program with the Environment Directorate at the OACD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And she is a value partner and collaborator of the Secretariat for a long time. Katya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Oliver, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is uh, with us here today. <clears throat> It's my deep pleasure to be moderating uh, this opening session of the 2021 Business and Biodiversity Week with today's first session entitled the Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and the Role of Business. We are indeed at a critical time, uh, one in which uh, where we have taken stock of progress over the last decade, and we are now in a once in a decade opportunity to establish a new global framework for biodiversity at COP15 in April 2022, that can reverse the tide of biodiversity loss. It is clear that we all need to act, government, civil society, and business. Um, and the drivers of biodiversity loss are just too deeply ingrained in everyday policymaking, in our household consumption patterns, and in business decision making. Biodiversity and ecosystem services are the foundation of our economies, our human health, and our well-being. Yet we are degrading biodiversity and nature as if they have no value. Today's session will go into these issues in further detail with a focus on business. Uh, there is today new momentum on this front uh, with a range of new initiatives um, created and commitments made over the past recent years. There's still a long way to go, but today we will hear from a number of leading businesses and companies that are taking biodiversity into account explicitly. We will hear about the post-2020 biodiversity framework, opportunities for engagement, and about emerging and exciting partnerships focusing on building and scaling up solutions and the necessary shifts to achieve the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. At the OECD, we have been trying to do our part as well. Our recent report, for example, on biodiversity, natural capital and the economy, prepared at the request of the UK 2021 G7 uh, presidency, provides specific policy recommendations to finance, economic, and environment ministries um, to mainstream biodiversity across all sectors and to embed biodiversity into financial institutions, covering risks, impacts, and dependencies. We have also been very pleased to be a part of the informal working group and the technical expert group of the Task Force on Nature related financial disclosures, which we will hear about today. And we are also planning to develop guidance for business on how to mainstream biodiversity into core business decision-making and risk management processes, aligning with OECD's soft law instruments and standards on responsible business conduct and supply chain due diligence. 
Before we begin, um, I'd just like to highlight today's session will include a brief presentation from the co-chairs of the open-ended working group of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, follow, followed by a moderated discussion with our distinguished speakers uh, joining us today. Please note that today's session is being recorded and the video will be made available in a few days on the Business and Biodiversity uh, Week's webpage. A message including the link to the recording will be sent to all registered participants. It is now uh, my deep pleasure to introduce Ms. Elizabeth Maruma Morema, Executive Secretary of the CBD, who has provided a message with opening remarks. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to join you at the opening of Business and Biodiversity Week 2021. I thank the business community for joining us and focusing on challenges and much needed solutions that will help us ignite the transformation required to sustain our livelihood, our prosperity and all life on earth. We stand at crossroads, even as the world continues to confront the COVID-19 pandemic and the interconnected climate and biodiversity crises that affect our lives. We are all still knowingly destroying our planet's life support systems. The time has come for all of us to come together, policymakers, civil society, financial entities, and the business community. Isolated efforts have limited results. We can no longer afford to work in silos or to wait or fail to take action. We must act decisively now. According to the World Economic Forum's 2020 Global Risk Report, biodiversity loss is one of the top five risks in terms of likelihood and impacts in the next 10 years. It is estimated that $44 trillion, more than half of the global GDP, is moderately or highly dependent on nature and its services. Dependencies on nature can vary considerably between different industries and sectors. While the risk to extractives and food is easy to grasp, the consequences for other sectors can also be significant. The Global Future Project estimates that under the business as usual scenario, the cost of biodiversity loss in some countries could be as high as 4% of their GDP per year by 2050. The unsustainable use of natural resources is underpinned by economic policies, consumption, and production practices that are not aligned with global goals. Parties have long recognized that governments alone cannot reverse the loss of biodiversity. The business engagement program with the Secretariat was established at the request of the parties at its 10th Conference of the Parties by a specific decision. In 2011, we established the Global Partnership for Biodiversity and Business, a network of networks that comprises dozens of national and regional initiatives with representatives in over 60 countries. This partnership allows a closer collaboration with the broader business and biodiversity community, business associations, coalitions, development agencies, NGOs, academia, and many other players that are investing in turning commitments and ambition into measurable actions. With Business and Biodiversity Week, we want to reach out to businesses everywhere from all sizes and from all sectors, including organizations already advanced in their sustainability journey and those trying to understand how to take the first step. It is an opportunity to keep the momentum alive, 
and to share different views and perspectives that we hope will be inspiring and innovative and informative. Today's opening session will provide an overview of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and pinpoint the role of business. We will hear different perspectives on what individual companies can and are doing. This includes how financial sector is getting organized considering the risks and opportunities associated with tackling biodiversity loss and how businesses and other stakeholders are collaborating through partnerships to support implementation. In few months, the Convention on Biological Diversity will adopt the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. The framework is a 10-year strategy to engage the entire world in the task of protecting nature and building a future of life in harmony with nature. Mainstreaming biodiversity within and across sectors and the effective mobilization of resources is critical to its success. One of the questions we keep getting asking is how can business get involved? Well, it turns out there is a lot that businesses can do. And I would like to highlight three main areas of action. This is where companies, big and small, national and transnational, can have a major impact by one, integrating the value of biodiversity by measuring impacts and dependencies of its operations and products and implementing strategies to avoid, minimize, restore, and compensate for those impacts and effectively reducing them. Two, greening and building resilience of value chains by working with business partners to identify gaps and solutions to tackle waste, pollution, and unsustainable and illegal use of natural resources. And three, supporting efforts on conservation and restoration of natural areas and balanced ecosystems, managing land and oceans sustainably and eliminating deforestation from all operations and investment portfolios. I'm optimistic that through collaboration, ambition, and concrete actions, we will ultimately be successful in reversing nature loss and in ensuring a healthy and prosperous future for all. I wish you a great week, and I hope to see you all next year in coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for those opening remarks and for really getting into uh, the, the need for uh, business to get engaged and how they can do so as well. Uh, it really sets the tone, I think, for, for the Business and Biodiversity Week ahead. Um, I would now like to invite Mr. Francis Ogval and Mr. Basil Van Havre, the co-chairs of the post-2020 open-ended working group, to share with us an overview of, um, of the, the upcoming framework. Good, uh, good day, and uh, well, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present. Francis and I will take turn, and I will be uh, sharing my screen in a second. Katya, maybe you can tell me whether you see the presentation. It should be up on yes, slide one. Yes, I can see it. Okay, it's a great. little small. Is it small? Ah, you Is should it... see. Let me see if I can do full. It's full screen here.
you should have the right screen now. Yes, thank you so much, okay. Basil. Thank you, and sorry for that uh, that uh, little organizing glitch. Uh, good morning to all. It's a pleasure to uh, to be able to engage you in that conversation. And uh, Francis and I will be uh, delighted to to uh, not only give you a brief, but certainly to hear your views and hear how we can we can work together uh, better over the future. So. Let's start from uh, from the start, which is the uh, the cause of biodiversity loss, and and you see at the bottom of the screen here the 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 five drivers: land and sea use change, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, invasive species. A couple of points that uh, uh, we wanted to add, and and science has been continuing to evolve since the assessment in 2019, and and. A couple of points Francis and I heard very recently last week is, is you can imagine that the relative importance of those five factors will be evolving over time. And, and science is, is indicating that the importance of uh, climate change as a driver of biodiversity loss will continue to increase. And in turn, the importance and the potential of uh, addressing some, uh, some of uh, the climate change issues through uh, how we can protect land and restore land will be increasing as well. So don't look at that, uh, at that scheme here as a static uh, uh, assessment, it is a dynamic one. And then thirdly, um, the point on, on the indirect drivers of, uh, of uh, biodiversity loss are, are continuing to be important and what scientists and modelers are telling us is demographics is, is a factor that should be kept in mind. So that's for the drivers. Uh, moving on to the guiding principles that we've been using in doing our work. Uh, as mentioned in the, in the previous slide, there is an urgency to act. Um, this is one of the biggest risks uh, we face. Half of our economy is depending on nature. Uh, the previous, uh, the previous uh, frameworks of targets were, was not as successful as uh, expected. And cl clearly, uh, the system in place at that time in terms of reporting and review has not uh, met its target. So here we are. Uh, it's kind of a once in a lifetime change to uh, to fix things before they get worse. Uh, we've been asked with Francis to lead a party-led process that is participatory, inclusive, gender responsive. I won't read through the, the certain uh, factors, but you can see them. I want to particularly point to you the difficulties in having both a realistic uh, set of targets, one that can actually be accomplished, but also ambitious enough so that we can reach that vision. And we need to uh, create a robust reporting and review. One of the, the conclusion of the diagnostic we've done is that uh, what uh, we need to, in order to be successful, is to create a framework that engage a lot more than ministries of the environment engaging uh, the productive sector, government as a whole, not just environment, but industry and, and infrastructure ministries, civil society, business like you, and the private financial sectors, farmers, everybody. So, so basically we need a system that is uh, that adopt a generic language that can be applicable to, to many, and, um, and also one that is built in a way that is open and, to, and onto which we can graft a uh, part coming from others. Here's a slide coming from uh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, you will recognize that, uh, how, how you move from a, a nature negative to a nature positive. We were extremely pleased to see uh, this coming uh, in the open and this coming from no other than the, the World Economic Forum. So I won't dwell uh, too much on that. Those are conclusions you're very much aware of, but it's very interesting to, to see uh, where we are. A couple word on where does the, the Convention on Biological Diversity situate among the, the UN system. Uh, it is one of the, the three Rio Convention uh, with climate, with the probably uh, you heard a lot about and the certification you probably heard less about. What people don't know is that the convention has three objectives. Uh, the first one is very well known, which is the conservation, but perhaps people are less aware of the other two, um, the, the necessity to have nature meeting people need as food, et cetera, and we will talk about that. 
and then uh, the um, the need to have an equitable sharing of uh, benefit and access to the the resources. <coughs> the, the the convention work on on set of uh, decadal targets uh, that we call global biodiversity framework, and and uh, we're now working on the one working all the way to 2030. These are a set of objectives, and, and the agreement is not one where the implementation is taking place. Implementation is taking place uh, at the national, mainly at the national level and the subnational level. But other conventions, such as CITES and the Chemical Convention, have a very important role. A, a couple words on on where we are, and I'm I'm not expecting you to read through all the very small um, uh, time. Uh, uh, time font that you have there, but but the message here is that we, we've been working since 2018, and, and like many, we've been uh, changing and adapting to a new reality of COVID, and we're now in the very last part where where um, the first phase of uh, the uh, last meeting of negotiation has started in August, and we'll be resuming phase to phase in January in Geneva. That's going to be a very important. And hopefully we'll be able to prepare a final package that will be delivered to ministers at the, the COP in, uh, in Kunmin in, um, a, at the end of April 2022. So that's the part I wanted to present to you. I'll pass the floor to Francis. Francis, the floor is yours and I'll turn the slide for you. Thank you. Thank you, Basil. And um, I'll try to take again some few slides and then Basil will finish um, the slide itself. So we just want to say when we make reference to draft one, um, we've tried our best really to come up with a full text of that document. And um, there are some areas where we have put numerical figures, elements, and that of course was based on what we had from the scientific body substar. And um, so the GBF itself um, has got, uh, in terms of the way it is structured or arranged, you have got the goals, which basically define the vision. Uh, try this time round to, 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 to make sure that the goals are also measured as we make progress towards the 20th the vision. Of course, we've had views on that. And then we have the milestones under each goal which define the state of the goals at 2030 timeline. That is, shall we have, by 2030, are we making progress at all towards what we want or we are stagnant? So the milestones themselves try to tell us whether there's any progress being made on those goals. Remember the goals are long term, but we are saying by 2030, could the milestone give us some view on that? And then the targets, which there are currently 21 of them, defines action needed to reach the milestones and eventually the mission and vision of the firm. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I think this, it takes a bit of time to come from my side. Now, this, some of you could have seen it also. And um, basically, it is when you look at this diagram, the theory of change of the framework, it should give you a picture, it should give you an overview of what the framework is. So we are on your left hand side, a very bad situation where things most of us, we know that things are not well at all, but we want to move through the process and reach the 2050 vision of living in harmony with the nature. Things are not good right now. So even our progress towards human well-being or development, the sustainable development goals, plus other issues like climate change, land degradation, they're just getting worse and worse. So what we intend to do with this framework is that we are going to have three core areas where our intervention on targets are going to be you know, uh, placed. So you have reducing threats, you have meeting needs of people, and then you have got the tools and solutions. So that is broadly how we have categorized the area of targets, they, they fall under those. But of course, we have got the mission itself to 2030, but also we need to implement. So you have got the means of implementation, but also people should be more responsible and transparent in this period. 
plus to have enabling conditions that can enable us deliver those targets. So once you've done that, then we should be seeing whether we are heading towards the goals. And that's why you see there's a, a kind of a, a, a dark shadow at first, but comes a brighter. Meaning as we make more progress towards the milestones, we get towards the goal where we want. So that dark side of things, eventually we should see it ending, we should be on the brighter side. And so in terms of goals, there are actually those four areas where the goals are. They're on ecosystem, species, genetic diversity, human needs, benefits arising from the lesser genetic resources, and then the means of implementation. So let's go ahead. So in terms of um, the framework itself, I told you that first, that our core business is to get into that future, the 2050 vision of living with harmony with nature. But that, of course, will demand those goals around it. Maybe because here you can, uh, yeah. So you you see that within there, those are the four goals that we are talking about, which is very much needed if you are going to get towards that desired future in 2050. So there are those four goals I already talked about. Then below each of those, we have the milestones as we have explained to you. So this is just try to you know, still brings you together. You'll see under A, you have those milestones, which are three. Then we have also under B, the milestones are there. So this is how the layer is essentially built. Coach, yeah, you could press the next one. And within that, then you have got the targets. So you will see that under each of those, um, for us to get those uh, the objectives, in this case, our goals, and the milestones, we have got those action targets that we are talking about. And then we have got those which are actually on reducing threats. They are the first ones that you see there. Then the next one is on uh, meeting the needs of people and then the mainstream aspect of the framework itself. So this is how we try to diagrammatically lay all this, uh, the future we want, how it relates with the, the goals, how it relates with the, the milestones, and then the targets, and of those enabling conditions we've been talking about. So if you look at all that we have spoken in, in, in within the targets that we have, you try to make sure that they will come up in one diagram as you see it here. Yes, Coach. Can go ahead. Now, looking at some of the targets that could be relevant to business. We will try to, to point or get some of them. But I give must say that implementation of these targets, all of them are the ones that is going to contribute for us to deliver those goals and get into the 2050 vision. So it is not that only a few of them needs to be implemented, but all of them. But in the case of business, we will try to select a few of them. And this is on target 14, target 15, 16, 18, 19, but also we are looking at target 9 and 10. It is on meeting needs of people. So when you look at the ones of meeting the needs of people, we are saying target 9 basically is with ensuring that those benefits that we so much derive and get from nature, that we have to make effort to make sure that they continue to exist. So the target is saying that ensure benefits including nutrition, food security, medicine, you can list them, livelihoods of people, that those ones really, we continue to make sure that there is sustainable management of terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems so that those benefits continue to accrue. Target 10, this is about agriculture. And you know that we are going to need a lot of food production in the years ahead. The population of the world is increasing. Maybe now we're about 7.5 billion. 2050, we could be even 12 billion, maybe. Now the space is the same. Agricultural productivity is needed. So what's going to happen there? So this is the target that talks about sustainable management of biodiversity within the agricultural sector, including even some of the ecosystems that you find there. Then we are talking about target 14. This is about mainstreaming now, that we should really see biodiversity being mainstream 
across sectors, across policies, across so many aspects, if we are going to be successful. But also issues on accounts, issues on access, assessment of environment, impacts, all this needs to be taken into account. Then the financial flows. This we should make sure that they are actually not endangering biodiversity, but rather the cause for biodiversity. Then target 15 is on about business. And for a long time, I think this is something within the CB that we have continued to really try to make effort uh, to, to gain milestones there as well, because we know maybe in climate change, there's more private sector participation there, but we're also been engaging private sector, but maybe now we are trying our best to make sure that there's a target that talks more specifically to the private sector. And then here we are saying that all businesses, public, private, large, medium, small, those who actually assess and report on their dependencies and impacts on biodiversity, because most of the businesses actually, there's a lot they could lose with the loss of biodiversity, but there's a lot they could gain with the biodiversity you know, being better managed. So that is what that target talks about. But also you are looking at now sustainability of some of the sectors, extraction, industry, you know, production practices, how is the private sector moving forward in the next uh, 10, 20 years? Then 16, this is about uh, dealing with um, aspects of responsible choices, reviews, re reducing food waste, reducing waste. This is where, again, I think the private sector could come in to help us see how do we address this matter? Because the more people become more wasteful with the food and so forth, the more degradation we expect to happen to the environment because when people just cook a lot of food, they don't need it, they pour it, they go back to nature to continue degrading, to provide as much, they waste it. So people should be more responsible and therefore giving them information that can make them make informed choices. That is what this target is talking about. But in a nutshell, we need people to reduce waste. People should be more responsible. And then 918 is talking about subsidies. This is the gist of the matter as well. There's a lot that is, a lot of financing that is happening to be from the private sector investment. But now there's a realization that you have a lot of that impacting negatively on biodiversity. So we should aim at reducing those. And therefore, we are thinking that maybe there could be a possibility of us leveraging up to $500 billion, which are currently negatively impacting on biodiversity and turn that, repurpose it, make it more beneficial for biodiversity. And target 19, this is about now increasing finances from all sources. And this is another important, a framework which is not going to be implemented, a framework which is not resourced. You can be sure that all this effort we've done, I don't know, coming two and a half years, will just go to waste. So we are saying that um, increase financial resources from all sources to at least two, 200 billion per year. That is what the target is, 200 billion per year, including new additional and effective financial resources, increasing by at least 10 billion, and this should be going per year again to developing countries to help them with the applications that they need. And um, you will see we have also talked about leveraging private finance. You know, so there's a lot that the private sector can come in here, the private finance can come here to make sure that this time around, we are not only looking at uh, leveraging resources for climate change, but also doing the same for biodiversity and for information. For us as co-chairs, and I think for most people now, we are saying that financing biodiversity and climate change should really go hand in hand. Let's not do one and say the other one shall get back to it later. The two relate so well to each other. If there's a loss of biodiversity, you expect climate change to get worse. If there's a, the climate change impact is increasing. You expect biodiversity loss also to be increasing. So really these two, we need to see how we harmonize their funding so that we are able to address this global crisis on biodiversity and climate change. Next slide. Francis, you want me to take uh, over? Yes, I think now Kochia is gonna take the slide, the remaining slides to the end. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. A couple, a couple of reflection on uh, to leave with you as we complete this presentation. Um, first, 
let's uh, let's look at some uh, padding and and some uh, so international trade is it negative or positive for nature it can be both as you know a lot of people are talking about the negative about imported deforestation and and deforestation in case of trade that do not uh, carry the full uh, the full cost but <clears throat> very few people and I, and I and i hope we can increase that talk about the positive aspect where where we can have food production taking place where it's most efficient and in that way limit the impact of that production globally so looking at it from a global perspective than than a national one and, and perhaps what um, our institution has to do is to try to find a system that enable to have the right balance so ensuring that the market force take us, take us where we want to go and, and that we have that food production taking place in the best place and then we can use international trade as a positive force in the in the mix second point on on risk and and a lot of discussion on on disclosure lately um we we've all have seen the 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 progress of the tnfd the launch etc and that's going to be it's going to be very interesting the second part is going to be on mitigation and and there i think we're all also encouraged to see how the situation is evolving on the climate side and and our confidence that uh, financial institution will will want to replicate uh, perhaps even quicker what they've done on climate on the nature side uh, we've talked about the impact francis has described the targets in the previous uh, in the previous uh, uh, discussion and and we've we've talked about the, the need to to have an identification of the impact and a reduction so really what we're looking for is is trying to increase coherence integration and synergy and and have a framework that is realistic and look at uh, both the reali the the reality of the biodiversity and the, the the problem we face, but also the reality of the, the tools we have at our disposal. And then, and then uh, some some final thoughts before we, we finish the presentation. Uh, lots of tools available uh, in front of us. Um, we realize that we need to build a system based on gold at a high level enough uh, level so that it allow to be tailored uh, at the national level and implementation will be different. Um, we we encourage you and uh, uh, to make uh, to come up with what you want we've seen the various uh, uh, communication and requests coming up from major sectors but beyond that it's important that you commit to what you can do and and what ambition is appropriate for your sector that's going to be very important um, this is a framework that, uh, and I repeat that from the beginning, is if we want to be successful, we need all part of society to be active. If this end up being a, a framework of the environment ministry, we will be repeating the situation that we've seen in the past. So uh, keep on your good work. And, and, um, and finally, uh, those of uh, you and the sectors that will, will uh, get ahead, transform early, will be uh, standing to gain immensely. So uh, that's the conclusion. We're now uh, in between the two phases of the COP and, and I could not help but showing you a sustainable fish processing plant in uh, Northern Canada. Thank you very much, Katia, back to you. Thank you so much, Francis and Basil for that excellent overview of the process. Um, I particularly like the slide uh, showing how all the targets and elements fit together and the, the circular diagram and also uh, highlighting the fact that so many of the targets are directly relevant to uh, the business sector. Um, but now, uh, with, without much further ado, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speakers today who have kindly agreed to join us. I have the pleasure to introduce Ms. Magali Anderson, Chief Sustainability and Innovation Officer at Holcim. Uh, Mr. Thomas Lingard, Global Sustainability Director at Unilever. Uh, Mr. Claude Fromageau, Chair of the Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity and Head of the Sustainable Development uh, at Group Rocher. And last, not, last but not least, Simon Zadek, uh, Chair of the Finance for Biodiversity Initiative. 
And so um, what I will do is I will start with an opening question that is for all of you. And I will ask each of you to respond um, in about for in over a period of like two to three minutes uh, per speaker. Um, and then I will uh, ask specific questions to each of you if that's all right. So first of all, the question for all of you. Uh, the world is going through some urgent and defining crises the loss of biodiversity and climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic added an extra layer of complexity and urgency in rethinking our relationship with the planet. And it is widely acknowledged that we have a very tight window of opportunity to act before it's too late. I would like to ask each of you, why in your view, is it important that the private sector takes action to help reverse biodiversity loss? And I will start with Magali. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me at the opening of the Business and Biodiversity Week. I'm very honored to be here with such distinguished speakers. Um, I think Elizabeth Rema said it all. The time has come. So I, I'm not going to go on all the nature losses and how business rely on it. The speakers before me have done that way better than I could ever done it. I just want to bring a couple more elements here, which is the mega trend. And, and I'm with Holcim, so I'm in the construction sector. And if you look at the mega trend, we have about 2.5 billion people who are going to move to urban areas in, in the next 30 years. More than 60% of that infrastructure doesn't exist, which means we need to build New York City every month. And if we do it without considering nature, without, as you said, Katia, earlier, living in harmony with nature, I think it's a real disaster. And this is why it is so important to bring back on how we bring nature in everything we do. And it's not just a question, you know, I could talk to you about pressure from investors, from employees, etc. But I think it's really about us as mm -hmm. human beings. How can we do a building without having the nature part of how we are going to do it? And I will just say two words about the nature strategy that we launched at the IUCN, where we took a commitment on water, because it's both stream for us in water, not just in terms of reducing water from our process, but also on replenishing every water drop of water we use and replenishing to the nature and to the uh, communities, but also on biodiversity. So we took a commitment on biodiversity to measure our biodiversity and to have a positive outcome by 2030. So we tried to put a measurement to our commitment of being nature positive. And I think that was really a tipping point of how, on how we are looking at it. Thank you so much, Magali. Uh, Thomas, can I pass the floor to you? Certainly, and thank you so much for, for having me and having Unilever at this important event today. Um, uh, you know, I think it's critical that private sector is, in, is involved in this, as with any of these big um, sustainable development transformations that we're seeking to do now. We're, we're talking about something that no one sector can do alone, no one actor can do alone. And, and the kind of mainstreaming of nature and biodiversity concerns into our economies can only be done with the perspectives uh, uh, and the agency of, of every part of society. So it's, it's fundamental um, that business plays a role. Business has a self-interest to play a role. It's not only a moral imperative that we're looking at here, it's an economic imperative. I think we've been very good at understanding um, impacts on, on nature, less good at understanding dependencies on nature. Um, often because they play out in a more complex way and over longer time periods, but dependencies they are nevertheless, and no business is suicidal. And most company boards, although it doesn't always uh, seem like that, are acutely aware of the need to manage for the long term and to create value over the long term. And as they become aware that um, raw materials or consumer bases are at risk from uh, from degradation of the natural world and the, the climate crisis that's attached to that, the more they become interested in in understanding these these risks and dependencies and, and the role they have to play in in uh, in taking action. 
and I think the, the action is both the action that businesses can take within their value chains and their operations, but also the role they can play as advocates for policy frameworks that can, can raise the minimum standards and raise the floor uh, in terms of what um, all businesses do, not only the, the leading companies. So absolutely critical that business is involved and, and thanks so much for organizing this event to, to raise the profile of that point. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I think um, it will be very interesting to also hear what actions you're taking. Um, I'll have the specific questions afterwards. And Magali, also you mentioned uh, the need to measure biodiversity and that you're you're doing that. And I'd be curious to also hear more about um, how how you're how you're doing that. Um, can I may I now pass the the floor to Claude Fromageau? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, first in all, uh, let me testify some important dates. Um, I have had the opportunity to witness uh, the adoption uh, of the Paris Agreement back in 2015, alongside Minister Laurent Fabius in Paris, and the energy and resolve in the room was high. And it was the same last month in Marseille, France, with the IUCN uh, Congress. I felt encouraged and inspired to see um, that stakeholders, politicians, academics, NGO, territories, finance institutions, banks, and of course businesses are definitively committed. Uh, to me, um, uh, this is a clear sign that the broader business community is aware of the impact of climate change, biodiversity loss, and the direct implication to social issues. Um, but Beyond that, I think that there is growing awareness about how the issues will have a deep impacts on organization in a broader sense. And from our perspective, we, we have long understood that our business model will be disrupted, that we have to reinvent our sourcing, our factories, our productions and marketing, our services, and the way we communicate with our consumer. Learning how to do this right is one of our main concerns. And following the Nagoya Protocol uh, was kind of first step for us. It made us see more clearly that our impact on biodiversity, um, non-financial management will be as important as our financial framework. Growth margin, turnover are obviously important, but only makes sense if combined with extra financial objectives. Our group was born in a small village, in poor village in Lagasse, Brittany, France, many decades later. And we still assess every day that sustainable economy locally mixed with conservation of environment, cultural sensitization, development of academic science and biodiversity, for example, leading to well-being and supporting biodiversity. Yeah, it's my point at that, at that stage. Thank you so much, Claude. And Simon, over to you, um, if you could give us your view on why uh, you believe it's important for the private sector to take action now. Thanks very much, Katia. And as my panelists have said, co-panelists, thank you to CBD for inviting us to participate. Look, um, why does business need to be at the table? Because they're part of the problem and they need to be part of the solution. And, and I don't say that with any particular businesses in mind. I say it more because our global economy is designed to extract value from nature without protecting it. Yeah, so that's not the fault of some business. That's the way in which our global economy functions. Now, uh, Elizabeth Morema made the observation that some estimates suggest that, you know, perhaps 45, 50, 55 percent of the global economy is moderately or very dependent on nature. Of course, the truth is 100% of the global economy is entirely dependent on nature. Uh, it just depends on how you measure it. You know, we wouldn't have a global economy if nature was in a deteriorated state or we would be scrabbling around with a global economy which had, I'm afraid, a very low value. So we need to look across the global economy. We need to understand that markets and businesses uh, as business as models are designed to exploit nature with very few exceptions and we need to change that picture very quickly and, and I want to reinforce the point that this is not um, a sort of hounding of bad ears this is a comment on the structural nature 
of where of, of how nature has fitted in to our economy. Now, today, the truth is, with exceptions such as those on the call, <clears throat> that there are far too few companies that take nature correctly into account. Uh, and we have both an opportunity and a challenge, and that comes back to some of the earlier presentations in the context of climate, because we have the opportunity to accelerate, and we'll come back to this, I know, Katia, later, because we've learned a lot about how to try and integrate climate into financial and broader business decisions. But we also have the challenge that there is rightly so much attention being placed on, for example, reducing emissions, uh, that many businesses are struggling to take on board a huge and highly complex agenda, which is as if not more important, um, uh, but is hard to digest. So, so the truth is, is that the, the nature agenda, with notable exceptions, is way, way behind um, for most businesses, most sectors, most parts of the global economy, and we have a lot to do to catch it up. Now, just briefly, a comment on finance, and I know Katia again will come back to finance in the sort of second round of the discussion. Now, obviously, Finance for Biodiversity, the organization I chair, focuses on finance, as the name suggests. Um, and, and it's worthwhile making a, a couple of observations. In the context of CBD, we rightly think about how to mobilize finance to invest in nature. Uh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that agenda and there's an awful lot right to it. But it misses the point of global finance. You know, let's not forget that when we talk about financing nature, you know, on a good day, we talk about a few hundred billion dollar here and a few hundred billion dollar there, really hard money to find. But when we talk about global financial markets, we're talking about $400 trillion worth of assets. You know, when, when we talk about public finance, we're talking about 20 to $30 trillion a year. When we talk about consumer expenditure, we're talking about $45 trillion a year and so on. These numbers are huge and they're important because they push us more towards an alignment agenda rather than a mobilization agenda. And I, I was very pleased in the earlier presentations from uh, senior people from CBD and the negotiating community because they emphasized both mobilization and alignment, although in the language of CBD that's framed as mainstreaming much more normally. And we saw within the Paris Agreement, uh, whatever it is, Thomas will tell me, I think it's 2-1-C, right? Uh, which is the critical clause around alignment of the financial system with climate goals. And, and we need to ensure that that text is replicated effectively within the CBD process and then we figure out how to action that in more effective ways. So again, we'll come back to the CBD connection to the agenda, but, but when you look at finance, in a sense, and I'll exaggerate the point and then stop cut here, we need to restrict ourselves, if not stop, talking about the need to raise money for nature, um, and I'm exaggerating to make the point, and we need to focus on how to align global finance with nature outcomes. One number to make the point, our global food system is valued at $8 trillion a year, more or less, depending on which numbers you look at. And the World Bank estimates that externalities per year, negative externalities of our global food system, you know, can be valued and we can debate the metrics and so on at $12 trillion a year. So, so what does that mean? That, that means if the food system was a company in a true cost economy, it would be completely bankrupt. Yeah, and a significant portion of that is nature, and that's the scale of the problem that we need to address. Yeah, and so it's absolutely right that there are a lot of great things happening. It's absolutely right that we're challenged on nature, but really the question becomes what are the rapid scaling mechanisms we can use to align major parts of the global economy with nature positive outcomes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And um, I uh, just like to say, I completely agree with your point on the alignment issue and the finance alignment. And I think that's something that also came out of the, the CBD um, technical expert group on finance, where they highlighted the, needs to, the need to raise money, uh, mobilize money, uh, to spend it more effectively. 
uh, more efficiently, in other words, and also to reduce the, the harmful flows. Um, I know Thomas uh, would like to react, uh, I think, quickly, ideally, to uh, Simon's point. So I'll pass the floor to him, if, if that's all right. I will be very quick. And, it, you know, Simon and I are kindred spirits in our love of systemic solutions to systemic problems. Um, and, and we will get into some of the specifics of the things that individual companies have done, but, but, but nothing can replicate uh, or replace the, the need for the policy frameworks that will drive action. And we talk a lot about the, you know, what can be done on nature disclosure, uh, on the model of climate disclosure. The reason the climate disclosure uh, work is having such momentum now is because of the Paris Agreement, because there is a clear policy framework that governments are seen to be responding to. And without that disclosure, uh, I think we'll not have the same on nature, will not have the same traction unless we get the same kind of links within the um, uh, the CBD frameworks and so on. So, uh, yeah, just to reinforce that point that um, we can talk about the great things that leading companies are doing, but if we want to see them systematized, it has to be brought back through to a, a policy link uh, at the governmental level and then in terms of what financial institutions are expecting. Thanks so much, Thomas. I, I did also want to say this question was about what, what the private sector can do, but I think the need for partnerships as well between governments sending the right signals also to the private sector and the private sector telling governments, you know, how they can help, what, what you know, to inform each other on how to set up the framework in the best way is absolutely necessary. I've, I'm not mistaken, I also believe that the recent Kunming declaration um, does use this language on uh, alignment of finance. So maybe we're moving a little bit closer in that direction also in the biodiversity community. Magali, if I can pass on to you with a specific question. Um, historically, companies have been much more active in the climate agenda, so building up on that issue. However, we have been observing encouraging signs that the private sector is becoming increasingly aware of their effects of biodiversity loss. In your experience, um, how can business integrate biodiversity into their decision-making processes effectively and decisively? So yes, Katya, I think, I mean, the first one is what you just said, to be at the heart of the decision-making. It sounds kind of obvious, but really what we saw in whole team is when we created the CSO position at the executive committee level, that made a big difference because now it's part of every discussion, every commitment, etc. The other point is, and, and Simon said it, it's everyone's business. I think there have been a bit of that understanding that nature commitment is for agricultural sector or people who have a direct impact on agriculture. I just, I hope I managed to explain why construction is super important and I'm sure we could explain that for every sector. So everyone has to feel concerned. We also need to understand the complexity. It took us one year to come up for, with our climate strategy and our commitment to net zero. It took us two years to come up with our nature strategy. And it's not by chance. It's not that we are prioritizing one to the other. It's that one was clearly easier to do than the other. And, and, and I think we are one of the companies that started a long time ago. For example, I was mentioning the measurement and we are going to measure using a tool called BIRS, which is Biodiversity Indicator um reporting system sorry <laughs> i'm always struggling with uh, and and that was put together between iucn and Holcim about eight years ago so it's not new it's something we had developed what is new is the fact of using it and the fact of taking a commitment but just to develop our first biodiversity index is going to take us until 2024 so again this is one of the major differences with co2 we're not going to be able to measure it just like this, and then our commitment is to improve it by 1990, uh, 2030, why 1990? Um, we also have, uh, we have about 90% of our quarries that have a biodiversity management plan with a target to get 100% by 2022. And so that shows how much we've been involved. But again, it's complicated. And one of the issues when it's complicated, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg. It's like you wait for the framework and while the framework is being is happening you you don't do anything and and i don't agree with that and that's why we decided ourselves to 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 work um since our announcement we were uh asked to be a members of the tnft work which we think is fantastic we're also very engaged with sbtn and i think everybody can do that everybody can start their own 
because if you if you just think about it you will find one way to do it if you really have no idea which uh, I'm, i have more respect than that for for business people that do have ideas is to start with maybe your ipnl we mentioned it earlier your triple bottom line we did it since 2014 and it's a very good tool to measure in your value chain where you have the most impact and it was for us an, an eye opener and, and finally um as you said it's about companies but i would say that um i am part of the advisory group of business for nature we fully support the work done on the cbd and the post 2020 global biodiversity framework is absolutely key we need some uh, simple measurement and some simple way to to engage people the same way that we do it for co2 so we know it's more complex but we have now so many smart people thinking about it we can do it and we really need clear rules for all actors uh, we talked about fi finance i will just finish with one thing i speak a lot with investors i get many many questions on climate i think i'm not sure i get more than two percent of questions on nature so and i would love to get those questions because i would have some fantastic answers if i was asked them so i think it's really involving everybody thank you so much magali if i can just very quickly i mean i i'd like to just highlight at least my understanding of why it is more difficult for biodiversity than for climate in case anyone out there is going to listen and isn't exactly sure i mean i think what was able to be done in climate is that they have the ton of co2 equivalent so you have the measurability one metric uh this a composite in index um, that can be used. Whereas for biodiversity, given all the different the different ecosystems, the genetic diversity, the different species, it's much more difficult to develop one indicator for that and the multidimensionality and the complexity of that. And hence, but of course, you can start with some basic indicators, as you said, and then build up over time. So there's no need to say, oh, let's wait <laughs> until we have the the, the perfect measurement um, framework. Um, Thomas, if I can come to you now with a specific question. Unilever has been one of the front runners in building the case for sustainability. The company launched last year a set of commitments and actions to protect and regenerate natural ecosystems, including a deforestation free supply chain by 2023. This seems like wonderfully ambitious. Uh, what practical actions is the company taking to tackle deforestation? And how are you planning to monitor progress between now and 2023? Thanks, thanks, thanks so much for that question. Um, I always think 2023 doesn't sound ambitious. We had been trying to do it for 2020, uh, being very transparent. And the, the system, systemic nature of that challenge just meant we, uh, we couldn't do it for them. But 2023 is our new deadline. It is indeed one of the um, targets we had within what we call the Unilever Compass, which is our um, company strategy and our sustainability strategy as, as a single document. Um, and it's a really important one because of the way it plays both to the, the nature and the climate um, climate agendas. Um, so what, we, what we're doing differently um, uh, post-2020 is really supplementing what had been a largely um, traceability and certified uh, commodity system. Um, with a, a whole new set of approaches. Um, one of those is to to go to more selective sourcing strategies. We used to buy from you know lots of different places on the open market um, and looking using certification as assurance of uh, of the sustainability credentials. We're now moving to much more uh, what we call direct um, directive and selective supply chain. Um, so we've made uh, our own uh, investments, 130 million euro investments in a, in our own palm oil refinery, so we can start direct relationships with the suppliers of and deforestation free and sustainably sourced um, uh, fresh fruit bunches in palm so we got much better visibility of the actual origins uh, and therefore can be assured of their deforestation free status so that's quite a big change um, you know it's not a sort of tick boxy strategy or an extra certification it's a big change in how we buy and how we process um, palm oil for example um, secondly and we've talked a bit about the, the importance of you know the social issues in all this and and um, supporting smallholders is a really important part of our plan we know that um, we've got to find ways that smallholders can diversify their incomes and can get trained up in regenerative agricultural practices uh, that will help in increase yields increase soil health and so on um, uh, and also uh, improve carbon sequestration in soils so a um, whole range of issues there that we need to work on with our partners training farmers 
issues around land title, access to finance, um, uh, in, to ensure that smallholders can can get a greater share of the value that they're creating. And then finally, um, the other big thing uh, uh, for the next few years is going to be around technology and enhancing technology. Um, we've got very interesting partnerships underway, looking at satellite data, geolocation, um, blockchain, AI, even um, looking at how we can um, get better real-time data of what's going on in supply chains. It's not we don't think it's good enough anymore to to just find out that some you know deforestation has happened and that the palm oil is already in the supply chain. We want to you know use this thing tech to kind of identify it before it happens and intervene um, if we think that um, you know developments going into areas where we we don't want it in our supply chains. Um, so this is all very exciting. Um, we're we're feeling pretty confident about the 2023 target. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is something everybody needs to get. Um, get on very quickly. Once the forests are gone, they're gone forever. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I completely agree. I, I love the fact that technology now will be able to give you, and has been for a recent while now, been able to give you so much more information, whether it's for deforestation or fishing in the in the seas, etc. So that's really wonderful. Claude, if I can come to you and ask you a specific question. So um, Yves Rocher is a family-owned business with a worldwide presence and a diverse portfolio. Can you share with us a few examples of measures you are taking across your value chains to ensure the sustainable use of natural resources? Yes, for sure, even if it's not simple. Uh, for example, in textile, uh, for our uh, Petit Bateau brand, um, we started a deep change uh, and we set a target of 50% uh, of for our raw material, cotton, sustainable by 2022 uh, 20, uh, and 100% by 2025. And the cotton we use for our brand uh, will be sustainable without GMO in organic cultivation and with soil preservation. We have also launched the second hand market. Uh, of our Petit Bateau brand, it's really a new path for us because it promotes a change in behavior of consumer and their consumption choice. And it seems to be a success. And for cosmetics, for example, the sourcing is a big part of our footprint. Our experience of organic agroecology uh, for our own cultivation for the past 30 years made us aware about um, even before that, the, the Nagoya Protocol, and, and now we continue with UOBT, Union for Ethical Bio Trade, to qualify uh, our sourcing of plants, both in France and abroad. And every sourcing is responsible on, the, on a path to support biodiversity conservation. And we, we are also looking into end use. Uh, for many years now, all our winds of products are biodegradable and non-toxic. And now our challenge is on phasing out plastic with a target of reducing in by 30% by 2025. Uh, plastic is near to um, impact on biodiversity, ocean, and things like that. To conclude, I want to mention that we have been developing agroecological practices in our own land of about 100 hectares, and we are now working with small holders and farmers to develop collective practices under supervision by local university and local NGOs. Um, to successfully implement change in companies, large or small, the focus needs to be on concrete practical shifts, while at the same time be able to draw up long-term vision, and so we, we know where we are headed, you understand? That could be one of my examples. Complexity is very tricky to address and to keep really uh, physically uh, understand, understand, understood. Thank you so much, Claude. I have to say I, I particularly like the fact that um, you have uh, specific quantitative targets that are time bound. And this is something that um, has been trying to be improved in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework by setting smart targets that are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time bound. So I was very pleased to hear about your specific target on plastics um, by I think it was 2025, 30% you said, and the one you mentioned as well before that. Um, I would now like to ask Simon, a question. 
Uh, Simon, uh, mainstreaming biodiversity into financial decision making is considered challenging, uh, particularly due to the complexities in measuring biodiversity and ecosystem services, which we referred to before, um, in terms of risks, dependencies and impacts. How can we accelerate progress in this much needed transition? Thanks very much indeed. And, and I just did, you know, want to acknowledge all three of my co-panelists who are quite rightly pointing out that one has to do practical stuff on the ground, as Claude said at the end of his um, second round of comments, as well as kind of emphasizing Thomas's observation after my original round, you know, that ultimately uh, that doesn't aggregate to a system level. Yeah, it has to be, if you like, flipped and used uh, in ways that can drive a uh, broader and larger scale change. And that's why it's so important to have companies and indeed financial institutions that are both doing stuff in their own shop, uh, as well as engaged, as this group is, in broader policy and regulatory engagement. Now, on the financial sector in particular, um, we're very pleased, uh, I am in particular, to have uh, been uh, given a lead role in helping to build out the first round of the technical work of the TNFD. And actually, Katia, you've also been part of the technical expert group of the first phase and have made a very helpful contribution. Um, it is clear that if we take a narrow view of nature risk, we will not get the job done. Yeah, so, you know, materiality, as we all now know, with some pain, uh, is something defined largely by lawyers and auditors, um, and occasionally by people who run businesses. Uh, and so we've learned in the climate space that we need a much broader frame than a narrow view of material risk. And in the context of emissions reduction, we've done that by casting out uh, in uh, uh, the, using the policy framework established under the Paris Agreement, creating scenarios around 1.5 degrees, making perhaps the heroic assumption that governments are going to drive us all to 1.5 degrees, let's look forward to Glasgow, and then building a transition risk framework that focuses on how asset valuation changes according to physical policy, liability, uh, and other risks along the way. Now, there is no 1.5 degrees for nature, and so we can't do the same thing, but we have to similarly get beyond a narrow view of short-term material risk, uh, but we have to do that without a 1.5 degree central policy scenario. Uh, and so the first step that TNFD has taken is to define risk in a different way. Yeah, and so we've defined nature-related risk as including, of course, shorter-term material, material financial risk, but including within a risk frame, nature dependency and impact, taking a view that actually that begins to build a longer-term view of risk as broader nature dependencies and impacts over time become material financial risk. So in a sense, we're integrating a scenarios model into the very definition of nature-related risk itself. We have to do that as a community because we don't have the time to get everybody first to focus on what legally and for accountants would be material today and then sort of get around to a longer game in the future. Uh, and we've learned both through the successes of TCFD and through the limitations of what disclosure is actually delivering that we also have to go significantly beyond a sort of market efficiency view of how to get the financial community to take account of nature. And I'll just give a couple of illustrations to make the point. So in the UK, um, there is the Environment Bill currently passing through its large state, last stages in Parliament. The Environment Bill will, amongst other things, establish a mandatory due diligence obligations for corporations to report on their deforestation effects throughout their supply chain, uh, and that is a good thing. Now, what's interesting is the way that flows across to the financial community, because it will. Because although FIs are not included 
within the Environment Bill, they will have to take account of new information flowing through their investees, the Unilevers of this world and many others, regarding deforestation in their supply chain and build that into their own enhanced due diligences around deforestation. Obviously only a part of the biodiversity equation, but a significant part in many respects. And to enhance that further, um, clearly where the financial community has succeeded in a sense in protecting itself, is that even if a JBS meat producer in Brazil you know, finds itself buying cattle stock from farmers that are operating on illegally deforested Amazonian space, the financial institution that may be providing trade finance to JBS has no liability whatsoever. They only have credit risk and the credit risk is not significant. And so there's also a second round of work, and these are just to illustrate the point cut here, focusing on the broadened application of anti-money laundering legislation to a broader range of environmental crimes and a broader range of circumstances. So there's the sort of let's, let's measure it and price it, that's a kind of TNFD type thing and that's important, but then there are many other levels at which we can actively increase the materiality of nature in financial decision making. Uh, and that allows us not to be just led by measurement, but to drive a whole new generation of standards and rules in multiple spaces in ways that will allow the work that TNFD is doing to price those new risks more effectively. And that will change the cost of capital to Unilever, and that will change the cost of capital to Wholesome and other companies. And ultimately, that's what needs to happen. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I'd just like to point out that we are very quickly running out of time. Um, uh, we have around 10, 15 more minutes. Um, well, less actually, uh, five, like six or seven more minutes. I'll keep my wrap up very short, so to give us more time here, but we've also received a bunch of questions uh, through all the participants. Um, so if I can ask each of you to just very, respond as quickly as you can so we can try and go through more questions if, if that's all right with you. Um, so uh, Magali, a question to you. Um, you recently took part in the IUCN World Conservation Congress in the business track, which included the first ever CEO summit, along with many other discussions and announcements, etc. Can you share with us very briefly um, a few highlights that you found inspiring and maybe were like real game changers? Well, I think to start with, to be there was absolutely inspiring. The ambience, the spirit, the enthusiasm of everybody. We could all meet together and use all kinds of acronyms that no one else understands, like NKVS, SCCA, and all kinds of things that was great fun. But for me, the, if I can take two highlights, the first one would be it was the first time the IUCN had a CEO summit and gave so much opportunities for businesses to express how much they feel concerned and all the collective actions that we can all do. I thought that was great. And the second one, I think I was quite impressed that we had people like uh, the President Emmanuel Macron or Christine Lagarde, who is the president of the European Central Bank. We even had, um, um, what's the actor? I forgot the name of the actor. Um, participating to the opening panel and really focusing on measuring by with a very strong message that what is measured get done. So I thought that was a very good sign. I could talk about it for 10 minutes, but you asked me to keep it short, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I, I do want to read one question before we run out of time from, uh, from the floor um, to give you maybe a chance to think about it. If someone would like to respond to that afterwards, please let me know. But the question to the panelists, and it's like a little bit of a tough question, which I like, um, measuring your uh, impact on biodiversity and managing your supply chain is key. However, why are businesses, and maybe not referring to you specifically, but why do you think businesses in general are hardly informing consumers on their biodiversity related um, impacts and uh, are not really including biodiversity aspects in their uh, marketing and, and green claims? So I'll, I'll, 
put that question on the side for a bit so that maybe someone would like to think about that and, and come back in a moment. Um, I do have a question for Claude, if that's all right. Um, Claude, uh, you're currently chairing the Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity, which was launched in 2011. Um, can you please share with us your perception on what is the role of partnerships and multi-stakeholder collaboration in supporting business to address global goals? And again, I really would appreciate shorter responses because th there are good questions and I'd like to, yeah, move through yeah, them. Yeah, uh, very shortly, the, the GPBB, Global Partnership, the, the platform is, is a chance. It's an opportunity to, uh, to share experiences to listen to the CBD, to understand more, more um, uh, what is doing, what is what is the, the context, and what what are the experience abroad in very different kind of countries and the cultural dimension, and uh, and uh, it's network. Uh, for example, I have the opportunity to work with and to connect with the GIZ in Germany, for example. Excellent work to share at the ground of uh, foundation initiatives on the on the on the on the floor. Then to conclude, I think that for many years um, the GPBB is a kind of community of people. It might seem uh, secondarily, but for me the, the the networking in such a diverse group of people is is really a chance and um, and that make possibility to to support participants uh, in their different kind of experience yeah thank you very much sure. claude sure. one question to thomas um thomas can you tell us um how can companies small and large support consumers in making more responsible choices and in rethinking their lifestyles i think we've often heard the question the other way around um, maybe voting or whatever, but how can companies help consumers make those choices? So uh, it's a great question. I might try and weave in a response on, on you know, why nature and biodiversity aren't being pitched more to, to consumers too, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, on, on the behavioral shift, um, I think the, the best thing for companies to try and do is to orientate their business models with the big shifts that need to happen. Uh, and this goes a little to Simon's point that, you know, we're working with a system that works in a particular way and expects um, businesses to chase particular goals. Um, we've set, for example, um, big new targets within our food business to to go into the, you know, plant-based uh, meat, plant-based proteins and dairy alternatives um, businesses. They're, they're seeing huge growth. We think we can drive them faster and we think that will have positive impacts on, on climate and nature outcomes. Um, uh, so huge amounts of work going on in, in Unilever and, and we think that's going to be a big part of, uh, of our future. If, if we think about the, you know, why is it, why are companies not coming out to consumers to tell them about biodiversity impacts? Um, I mean, biodiversity is a, a word with something like what, five or six syllables in it. It is not a consumer friendly word. Uh, it, it's not what a busy um, dad or mum in a supermarket with screaming kids tagging on their, uh, <laughs> on their coat is, is stopping to thinking about. So the, the art of getting the marketing right and the, and the messaging at the point of sale and in the advertising communications is, is a very nuanced one. And often, you know, if, if we take an example like our, our brand Noor, uh, which, you know, does sort of soups and sauces and, and stuff all around the, all around the world, um, you know, there's a whole load of Unilever sustainable agriculture codes and, you know, 100 page uh, guides to how farmers should be growing vegetables for Noor, and and that will end up being translated into an advert which might say made with sustainably sourced tomatoes. I mean that's pretty advanced uh, as it is, but that's basically all you all you've got time for in amongst all the other messages you're trying to land about how tasty a product is, or uh, how you know what good value it is, or how easy to prepare it is. So you know the what what goes on in the consumer's mind as they're choosing products is uh is complex and and you know trying to get the the right messages landed um it's not always going to be about very technical language and explaining the, the the complexities of biodiversity it's about reassuring people that companies are doing the right thing um and being responsible in how they're producing it so i i, I am probably less optimistic that a sort of technical consumer engagement uh, response is is the right way to go but certainly we are seeing increase in awareness of the climate and nature crisis and consumers reflecting that in 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 how they uh, make purchasing decisions thanks so much uh thomas for that 
Um, I'm quickly checking with the secretary. So we're going to maybe run over a couple of minutes, and I probably shouldn't have said that to you. <laughs> um, but um, Simon, I think we have time for one last question, so I'll pass it um, to you. And if maybe really uh, one or two minutes, because um, we're already gone through the time here. Um, you are one of the leading minds behind the recent and much talked about TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures. Could you please quickly talk us through what is in store for the task force and also why it matters? I think you've talked about a bit why it matters, but look, what are the next steps now for the task force? Sure. Well, I, I will ignore the thing about the leading minds and focus on how little time we have. Um, but I will also um, reinforce Thomas' point and generally the points about consumer behavior. And, and I would only make the additional observation the climate just frightens people, whereas nature is valued. Yeah, and so we have the opportunity of engaging people around nature in a way that we'll never engage around climate, and that is around values. Yeah, and I'm sure Unilever and all of the folks on the call are very uh, aligned and aware of that. So, so TNFD um, kicked off into its sort of full, full uh, approach after an eight-month. Uh, preliminary process around the middle of this year uh, and had its first plenary with um, its new membership, currently 32 members, all from the market, uh, with uh, two or three spaces still open to bring it to a total of 35. Um, interestingly, we've pushed forward five different working groups, which don't worry, I won't go into detail, um, but three of them are, if you like, foundational, you know, sort of definitions and concepts and frameworks and data and metrics and standards. There's a whole lot of landscaping to do to try and get a handle on what's going on and how best to look for convergence and improvement. Uh, but then also a working group uh, called the Beta Working Group, which is intended to drive a, a first product within 100 days. So what does that mean? Because it's relevant to the market. Um, so TCFD, you know, produced sort of a consultation draft after, I don't know what it was, Thomas, nine months or something like that, and very much had a sort of standards mentality. You know, you produce a consultation draft, lots of people say things about it, produce another consultation draft, and so on and so forth. And TNFD is trying to move more into what I would call a software network mentality, open source mentality, in that we will put out a first framework within 100 days. We will provide means by which that framework can be prototyped and tested uh, by many actors, many of whom we've never even met before. We will continue to provide updates on an ongoing basis, both upgrades as well as patches, and perhaps the way to think about it conceptually is like a more open source approach to software development than an approach to developing a standard, which of course TNFD is not seeking to do. That hopefully will move frameworks that can be more broadly used into the market much more quickly uh, and accelerate learning by forcing, crowding in feedback as to what the kind of metrics and standards and data and other things that different both FIs and businesses are using around the world. Over and above, the 35 core members that we have in the stakeholder forum with about 200 members as well. So in a sense, same as TCFD, but different in the speed at which we're coming to the market and we the way in which we think both learning and scaled up use can happen. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. And um, with that, I, I'd like to close this part. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers for today, um, for hearing from large and, and sort of the family-owned starting of, of businesses. Um, I'm supposed to wrap up, but I'm really going to do this extremely quickly. I'd like to just highlight some, some snippets, if you like. Um, that it's in the self-interest for business to get engaged and to act, um, that business is part of the problem and hence uh, needs to be part of the solution, 
um, that there's um, ongoing initiatives in, in the field of measurement of biodiversity. And I think everyone's looking forward to seeing how these measurement um, elements uh, become published like online so that people can compare and, and learn lessons from, from the measurement. Um, I would say the, the need for uh, clear uh, quantitative targets um, and public commitments from the private and business sector and with, with the measurement aspects so that you can monitor progress over time um, were perhaps just some of the key takeaways. Um, but we're really running late and I'd like to go ahead right now um, and thank you, first of all, again, for, for this very, very interesting session. Um, and I'd now like to invite Marcus Lehman, uh, Acting Director of the Science, Society and Sustainable Futures Division <clears throat> at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, and thank you uh, so much to everyone for staying uh, with us uh, here today. So Marcus, I pass the floor to you. I think you're on mute, Marcus. Unmute me. Excellent. Thank you, and a good time of the day to to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to start really to by by thanking you, Katya, for for agreeing to to moderate that session. I think you have done an amazing job, and I, of course, this is testimony of the good partnership with the OECD. Uh, we had over many years now. In fact, I could say several decades. Um, I also want to thank uh, all our panelists uh, for agreeing to speak and to share their uh, views and experiences. And a special thanks, of course, to our co-chairs, the co-chairs of the Open-Ended Working Group for the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework to talk us through the process and the results so far and to also provide an overview of what this process means for the business community, including the financial sector. Um, we heard today about the critical role businesses have to play in supporting the successful implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And we heard many good experiences and, and um, initiatives to take that forward. And in fact, a lot of progress has been done in the past years and, and the business and momentum and leadership is really building up. Um, which is of course very encouraging. I just want to mention a few examples like the uh, CEO letter that what is, was issued by uh, Business for Nature Coalition just uh, last week or the week before last week. But then also in initiatives like the uh, UEBT, the Union for Ethical Biotrade, with its uh, 56 member companies already reviewing their progress in their commitment to sourcing with respect to people and biodiversity. Um, in our commitment platform, the Sham uh, al-Sheikh uh, to Konming Action Agenda, uh, we already have a total of 500 business organizations' commitments, which is uh, very encouraging indeed. Um, just uh, even in the financial sector, there is uh, uh, financial commitments being on the rise where just last month we had the, uh, the, the, the commitment by 75 financial institutions. Um, and the list goes on. I mean, we, I could also mention the, uh, the, the commitment made in the context of climate change by nine philanthropic organizations to come up with uh, 5 billion US dollars over the ten, uh, next decade. Um, that, that is another important example. So we are very encouraged. Of course, more needs to be done and we're optimistic that more will become. The important thing here is that uh, um, as, as uh, some of the panelists mentioned, biodiversity loss is a, is, is a shared problem. So it will take a village to face the challenge and it will make take many stakeholders and many actors working together. So business community in that sense it includes certainly businesses themselves, but it also goes beyond. It includes the business associations that develop the initiatives, programs, and solutions for their members to implement it. Uh, it, it includes, in that sense, the public financial institutions that are also working together with their private counterparts on including nature into financial risks and 
considerations. It includes um, the organizations like TNFD that played a prominent role in our discussion today uh, that have been working on the development of tools and metrics to help companies to understand their environmental footprints. And last but not least, it also includes the policymakers that are building the, the, the policy frameworks that will create an enabling environment for businesses to scale up their efforts. So what we are trying to attempt with the Biodiversity Week uh, is, is to basically have a week-long session that brings these different actors together and think about it, taking stock, what can be done more. Um, it is a stepping stone uh, meant towards the second phase of COP15. Um, so uh, on, on the journey to Kunming, so to say. Uh, where in the coming months we will try to support parties in finalizing the negotiations culminating in, in COP15 uh, and that, that will lead to the adoption of the global biodiversity framework and then in, through that process basically keeping stakeholders engaged and keeping, keeping, keeping basically an active discussion among the different sectors that brings together the business community, the CEOs and the policy makers. So to conclude, thanks again uh, for all being with us here today. I hope you will stay over the remainder of the sessions uh, this, this week. And I hope you see you all in Kunming. Thank you.